Hello and welcome to Stargazing, the show that brings you up close and personal with your favorite stars of reggae and dancehall music, Jamaican popular culture, and people who've impacted society in a very big way. I am Sean Kane. In this edition of the show, we'll speak with an investment banker who believes that every Jamaican should make the acquisition of investment assets a priority in their lives. Let's take a look. Dino Hines has spent much of his working life handling other people's money. But while he was doing so, his mind was ever becoming preoccupied with ideas about how he could generate some for himself. Hines attended the Kingston Technical High School where he pursued a course in accounting and business education. After graduating, he went to work at the then Jamaica Citizens Bank. It provided invaluable experience for him and he was at home surrounded by what he knew for a long time to be a very important possession in life, money. While working at the Citizens Bank, Hines realized that he needed to learn more about banking in order to progress up the corporate ladder. The young banker said when he listened to the news, the terms such as share capital, the markets, dividends investment, securities, return on investment, equity, spreading the risk, blue chip, bonds, foreign exchange and investment options among others brought much fascination to him. He told the Stargazing with Sean Kane show that it was during that period of his life that he accepted that his relationship with investment banking was going to be a very long one. Shortly afterwards, Hines enrolled on a certificate management studies course at the University of the West Indies. During this time, the Citizens Bank had disappeared, having fallen victim to the disastrous banking crisis of the 1990s. He then went to work for Manufacturers Merchant Bank and eventually ended up at First Global Bank, FGB, in 2004. He left FGB in 2009 as head of the Treasury and Investment Department. Heinz noted that it was a great time to be alive, as he was feeling at home in his investment banking role. But deep inside, he knew that he wanted more. A very promising position became available at Mayberry Investments Limited and Heinz was successful in applying. He eventually climbed to the lofty position of Senior Vice President. It was also during his time at Mayberry Investments that he completed his Master of Business Administration degree at the University College of the Caribbean, UCC. Although Heinz's head appeared to be touching the ceiling at Mayberry Investments as he was so high up in the organization, his enterprising spirits were nudging him to start thinking about building his own empire. Without much deliberations, Heinz was on the march again. But this time, the mission was different. With shovel and measuring tape in hand, his next stop would be at an institution that he would help to build from the foundations up microfinancing solutions mfs the astute businessman has been steering the institution along treacherous terrains that are often haunted by the dreaded signs of a bearish investment climate however he knows that the bears will always leave and make way for the more generous bulls of the investment banking pastures since 2014, he has been the chairman of the MFS Group, a conglomerate comprising a diverse business portfolio ranging from hardware to hairstylists and petrol stations. The parent company, MFS Limited, offers Jamaican and US dollar loans and bill payment facilities as well as the purchase of account receivables, among other financial services. Heinz says the future promises much as MFS will be forming a strategic alliance with a much stronger player in the Jamaican financial sector. The chairman explains that the merger to be announced not long from now will give MFS greater leverage in the local and international financial markets. Welcome back. Dino, what's up, Sean? It's been a long time, man. Many, many, many years, man. So it's really great talking to you now. Yes, thank you very much. Very good talking to you also. That's good, that's good, Dino. But you know, as, 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 as I'm here with you now, many people see banks simply as a place where they can just safe keep their money. They can put money in when they feel like it and they can take it out when they think there's a need to do so. 
But I kind of feel that that's just one model of banking. Would you agree with that? Yes, it is, because that is the traditional um, commercial banking aspect. The role of a commercial bank is really to um, um, collect deposits and to give loans. But there are other type of banks, um, investment banks and you know, private equity firms which are um, close to banks, but not banks. So it depends on what you really are looking to achieve that will help to dictate the um, investment house or the bank that you choose. As you mentioned that, I remember a conversation we had some time ago and you were advocating very strongly that people should prioritize owning some form of investment assets. I know that people own lots and lots of assets from cars to clothes and even their desert clock shoes. <laughs> but would you say that those qualify as investment assets? I know those are not because as you walk out of the store or you walk off the car lot, those assets start to decrease in value. Um, so when you're looking at investment assets, you're looking for things that you look that has the potential to appreciate in value. So uh, real estate, stocks, bonds, those are the kind of assets that will really qualify as investment assets. That's very good there, because I, when I heard first, I thought, well, probably if I got a little taxi, you know, go to the car lot, get a taxi, and put that on the road, you know, that would turn me some money because I'll drive that, collect my fares from people, and that would give me some money. But as you say, the value of that will fall. So that's not quite such a strong option. Well, I mean, you, you, you buy, you have bought a car and you have bought it to, to use to earn. So you're, uh, um, you're earning revenues from that car, right? So that is a way of earning maybe passive income. Um, passive income being income that you have to do nothing to actually earn. So if you buy the car, you give it to a driver, he goes out and he um, makes money and give it to you, then that's passive income and you really haven't done have to do nothing else apart from collect the revenues from that asset. So that would still be considered an investment asset, even on a lower scale? Yeah, it would be. Would it? it? Would be in that regards. It would. As mm. long as the asset but, is earning for you, then it's, it qualifies as some form of investment asset. But I also suspect that the banking industry might be taking a massive beating as businesses seem to be shutting down here, there and everywhere. Now, is it the right time for anyone to be talking about investment assets? It is. Um, you see, there are, there are a lot of assets which you would consider blue chip assets, which um, as it, even at this time are very much undervalued. So take a look at maybe the Jamaican um, stock market, for example. National Commercial Bank, which is our largest commercial bank and a blue chip company in Jamaica, um, trade before the pandemic traded as high as two two hundred and fifty dollars. It's currently trading at about a hundred and thirty dollars. The entire fall off in price is just due to the pandemic and the time that we're in. So a, a good investor would look to say, you know, I can pick up some of these assets, some of these NCB stocks at this price, with the intention that after the pandemic has subsided, the stock will trade back at its natural price of. Um, over $20. So that means buying NZB stocks should not be something that people are looking to get any returns from right now. They should just be holding on to those, watching them. Right, it's long term, it's long -term investment. So at this, during this period, I think that um, investors have to be patient. Um, you know, you can't look to get immediate returns. What you want to do is to pick good, solid, strong investment assets with the intention that 18 months to 24 months you will start to see return on these assets. So it's a time to choose carefully, but it's not a time to stay out of the market. But the banking sector is still not so steady at the moment though. It's, I think, I'm not sure how well it's recovered since 2008 when we had the massive uh, fall off there. Would you say that things got well, quieted yeah. down or they are still shaky? Well, the, the good thing is that after 2008, what, what happened is that a lot of um, governments in the US, in the UK, Europe, Jamaica, all over, what they did is that they actually strengthened the regulations and insist that banks um, have a greater level of capital adequacy. So even if in the short term, banks are not making the massive profits that they would, their capital is so much stronger that they're able to navigate um, these periods of uncertainty much better. 
but even though they're not earning as much money, would you say that what they're earning though is still enough to cover whatever they overheads they've got and whatever costs they incur, so that they don't? Definitely, I think they, 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 the main risk for banks now, especially the traditional commercial banks now, would be um, non-performing loan portfolios. But what you will see, especially in the United States happening, is that the Federal Reserve has actually intervened, intervened with massive amount of, of cash being pumped into the real economy to help um, small businesses. So what's important, and I believe it will happen, is that another round of stimulus um, activity will happen now that the election um, is over. I think the motivation is to actually pass another stimulus bill that will actually push cash into the economy and help these small businesses to continue to, to survive and to be able to service their debts to the commercial banks. Now, when you present investment options to your customers, I presume that a specific figure or some form of proposed rate, maybe a range or something like that, is agreed with them. Probably you say somewhere that the returns might be between 0.5% and say 2% or so. Is that the case or do you give them a specific figure that this return will be, we're agreeing to 2% or 5%? How does it work? Well, there are different types of investments. So there is what you'd call fixed income investments. With those type of investments, um, you actually will, as you say, create um, um, indicate the return. The only thing that can happen in that scenario that can change that would be um, whether the bond should default or if it should go up in price and then you will get some corporate gains on that, plan, or on that bond also. But there are other type of investments so like stocks which has no predetermined rate of return. With those it is to the advantage or it is left up to the skill of the trader or the investment banker to choose the right assets for the client that will go up in value. So some assets are fixed income, others are variable. And when you when they take on the variable ones and things don't quite work out as they expect, how do you break the news to them? Do you feel a bit guilty about it or you just tell them, well, this is what happened, Mr. So let, let me so you 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 you, you structure your client's portfolio um, based on a number of things. One of them would be appetite for risk. So before you actually, in terms of establishing a relationship with your client, you will go through a process of actually doing an assessment, um, getting their risk appetite and seeing what um, kind of risk they're willing to take. There's another aspect also in terms of um, the age of the client. So if a client, for example, is past retirement age, you will not put them in a risky asset. So if, if that client is insisting that they want a risky asset as a, as a um, good investment banker, you will say no. You will, you will tell them to go somewhere else and get that because you don't believe that a client like that should um, put, be put in that. There's also the, the, the aspect of looking at, as, as to whether or not a client is an accredited investor. An accredited investor is one that has a significant network and therefore is able to withstand certain amount of losses. So to go back to your specific question now, um, the, the most important thing in my opinion with, in terms of interacting with our clients is to always be giving them information and be always working to protect their portfolio. So if you buy a, a, a stock for a client and the stock goes down in, in value, don't be afraid to go to the client and say, you know, you bought this stock, it has fallen off. However, I think it's still a good investment, so I'm, invite, I'm, I'm, I'm advising you to hold and in another six months, I think it will go back up. Or to say, well, you know, we bought the stock, circumstances have changed, the environment has changed. I believe it will continue to go down, so I'm advising you to cut your losses here and to exit, and this is a different investment that I'm recommending. So be open, be honest, and to just keep communicating with your client. Very, very good there. And, you know, I like the sound of that because it provides some form of reassurance and people know that you're looking out for them. In other words, you've got their backs, you know? Exactly. And that's very good to hear, though. But in terms of the investment climate in Jamaica now, what are some of the better performing stocks out there? Well, as you would expect, I mean, if you, if you have followed the Jamaica Stock Exchange over um, the past six years, you would know that Jamaica has outperformed the world in terms of our stock market um, generating massive wealth for, for investors. 
as expected with the pandemic a lot of our stocks have, have fallen in price and a lot of them are below the value where they started the year at so there are two options to look at now you know without even calling specific stocks there are two options to look at one blue chip stocks that are undervalued two stocks which pay good dividend give you a good dividend yield so you have some stocks for example on the exchange like a career as that granted year after year they're going to be paying you upwards of six percent in terms of dividend yield so you know you're not going to be getting capital gains now because um the stock market is not doing so well but you know you're guaranteed that six percent um dividend yield um so those are some other stocks you're looking at the, the long-term investments in terms of blue chip companies that a year 18 months from now will give you some good returns and the good strong dividend paying stocks like a career as or a scotia bank that you know will continue to give you a steady return during the pandemic and then after the pandemic will also appreciate well at least something is coming is coming through so at le- you know even though you say it might not be at the level that the customer would have expected well at least they're making profit they're getting dividend so there is a return coming on their investment and it's a positive return mm. yeah there is a return um, I like the advice that you give to your clients and the way you kind of look out for them, which is your job as an investment banker anyway. But was helping people to become rich always what you felt was your life purpose? Well, yes. Um, I think that in terms of um, guiding clients, helping them to achieve wealth, because one of the things that I've always looked at is you, you're not looking to make, to become rich of any one client. What you're looking to do is to Establish a relationship with a client, work hard on their behalf, um, ensure that they make good returns, and then that will become a loyal client that you will have forever, and therefore you will start to make money from the client. So, so it's about actually taking an approach of building that st- slow, steady relationship, building slow, steady wealth, instead of trying to hit the ball out of the park one go. And when you have established that relationship and your client, you have delivered for your client over and over, then you will actually have a client who over time you can start making money from. And, and investors, are they rich people? Or they could just be, you know, a poor person like myself? No, I think everybody should become an investor. Um, you know, persons sometimes will look at and say, you know, I don't have enough money to invest. But that's really not true because, um, for example, you know, if you start putting your your funds, it's slowly build it. So let us talk a little bit, for example, about um, evil persons with children. If 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 from day one, when you have a child, you start to build an investment portfolio for that child's university education, and by the time that child gets to eighteen, they won't have to take student debt. So it's about slow, steady, but building and being consistent. That's what it requires to become an investor. And that means they need to come and talk to an investment banker like yourself. It's not something you just put some money under the mattress and that will do it over 18, 20 years. They have to come and talk to you, you reckon? Mm-hmm. You, you, you speak to your investment banker because, you know, one, one of the greatest thing investing is compounding. So that um, 5% return that you're getting you now, compounded over 18 years, you might be surprised at what that portfolio will look like by the time you get ready to start to draw down on it. So um, putting money under your mattress is not going to earn you anything on it. Um, in fact, it will become, it will be eaten out by inflation. So it's about, you know, building that portfolio, slow and steady, whatever you can do at the time. You know, over time you might get a lump sum and you throw it in that portfolio, but start. The most important step is making that first start. Uh, Dino, how did you get into banking? Um, you know, honestly, it was, I mean, I don't even remember when we were at KT um, years ago, we used to have um, career days. And, you know, when a, a banker came to make a presentation. And honestly, when I, when I saw and I heard, you know, what they did, I got interested. And, and then um, Delroy Farr, God rest his soul, after leaving high school, he got me a job. Um, at, a, at one of our local commercial banks. I enjoyed that. And then over the years, um, got into the treasury side of banking in terms of trading um, stocks and foreign exchange. And that was even more interesting. And then I transitioned over fully into investment banking. Mm, very nice. So what kept, what kept you there then? Was it the money that you saw rolling in? No. 
it was just your passion? Well, I think it's more a passion because, I mean, I really enjoy sitting down, doing the research, analyzing different options. And, um, you know, I enjoy presenting um, these options to my clients. I really look at this in terms of what I'm doing, in terms of building something that is long term, something that your children can come and inherit um, after you're gone. So I look at I look at it in that regards, in terms of, you know, um, after, so, you know, as I said, I started out in the back office in terms of accounting and, you know, operations and settlement. Um, but when I actually went front office now in terms of trading and making money, that really excited me. And that's really where I started to really enjoy banking and enjoy um, this aspect of business. Well, I see you really enjoyed it because you spent some time at Mayberry Investment as a senior vice president. How has that prepared you for where you are now in your career? Well, let me just say one thing that in my experience of, at Mayberry was extremely great because one thing that Mayberry does is that they invest a lot in your education and they give you an opportunity to actually widen your, your knowledge. So, you know, a lot of the larger investments houses, you are a specialist. So you might be an FX trader, you might be a bond trader, um, you might manage um, money market. But at Mayberry, I got the opportunity to actually touch on all aspects of that. I had um, a great leader in terms of gear repair who actually taught me quite a lot. So that experience at Mayberry was really good and it actually prepared me for where I'm looking to go right now. It's, it's like music to my ears, Dino. It's just always great to know that people can actually look back and show some appreciation for what they got from where they were before. So you were looking back at Maybury and you reflect on the experience you had and the opportunities that you had, and you are paying tribute to Maybury and Mr. Peart. Well done to you. Yeah, definitely. Well, that, that's very, very nice of you, very kind of you, Dino, to actually say publicly what you got from Maybury, how they helped to develop you. But you took a very bold step a few years ago when you left that job at Maybury to start your own business. What made you feel that you were ready to fly the nest at Mayberry? Well, I mean, can anybody really think that they are fully ready? <laughs> Maybe not. But it's a point, you have to come to a point in your career where you want to actually transition from being a, um, an employee to actually looking to build something for yourself. So yeah, the experience was actually um, great. But at the end of the day, um, you can't leave a job to your kids. So you're looking to try and build something which is more your legacy. And, you know, it, 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 that drove me to actually look to say, okay, let me, let me take, it's risky, but let me um, step out and actually try and look to build something for myself. How daunting was that, Dino, when you stepped out and you know that the doors were shut behind you, you could hear them, and you know that, am I my own here? I'm, I'm entering into uncharted territory for myself because I've not done this on my own. How did that make you feel? Well, you, you try to prepare as best as possible for what's in front of you, but you still will feel um, a lot of second guessing. Am I making the right decision? But let me just share how I approach um, actually going on my own. So when I, as, a, as an investment banker, I, I always taught my clients, that the most important thing you can do in terms of building your asset portfolio is diversification. So I looked at my clients and I would always say, you know, you're not going to buy um, stocks just in the financial sector and manufacturing. You're going to go financial, manufacturing, distribution. You're not just going to buy stocks. You're going to buy stocks, um, bonds, um, corporate people. So you diversify your portfolio. So if one of your assets should fail, then you will have the option to fall back on others. So in terms of stepping out, I did not just step out and um, with a financial institution. What I did was invest in other small businesses. So at one stage, I had as much as nine small companies, address in salon, manufacturing and distribution, hardware, gas station, all of these things that I actually acquired as companies to ensure that I had a diversified portfolio along with um, my financial institution. So if one is not doing well, then I have the other to fall back on. So that gave me a lot of comfort and um, a, a lot of assurance to say I am I'm now ready to make this move. 
as the financial institution right. grew and um you know i become more comfortable then i started divesting myself of some of the smaller companies to be able to focus more but even at this point um as a group we're still involved or invested in companies in non-financial institutions so i walked out and i went straight into um my own company um we had a small loan company microfinancing solutions and that's exactly where I went. As I said, we had some other smaller companies also, but the main focus was on building microfinancing solutions. So was the word Russell Road paved with gold or were there some bumps along the way? What was the experience like? Um, it, no, it was certainly not paved with gold. Um, so when we started out, when I walked out, um, of course, the company was still small. I wasn't able to actually pay me a salary. But what I did before I left, um, my formal employment was to actually save up one year's worth of mortgage and some other um, necessities and that gave me the comfort to say, okay, I'll be able to survive without um, um, any serious salary for at least this period. And it gave me a time to allow the company to breed and to grow. So, um, you know, you took that approach. There, I mean, a lot of different um, drawbacks. You know, you have to work hard at the at that point, we had um, very minimal staff. You have to carry out your own garbage, you had to do your own bare work. But at the end of the day, you start, you just set yourself mini targets, and each month you will have a victory. Um, you grow your portfolio by a 10% um, for the month. You feel very excited about that. And you're encouraged to continue to along the path that you're going. Right. So it was really very quiet mean and lean as you started out because you didn't want too much by the way of fixed costs and all those heavy overheads sort of you know stifling the business exactly exactly very good now i gather that the dream is growing now and before that though did you ever feel like going back to your old job i know you like them quite well and they did a lot for you but did you at any point feel like what did i take what, what did i get myself into I want to run away from this. I, I, I'm, I'm scared here because things are caving in on me. Quick answer. Any thoughts of that? The quick answer, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> Many times. <laughs> Many times. And <laughs> even over the years, I have been offered positions in other institutions that has really been tempting because they are quite lucrative. But, um, you know, you have to look and keep your eyes on the prize and realize that, yes, in the short term, this might be more um, viable, but long term, you're looking to see, you know, you know, my mantra is um, um, dividends are better than um, salaries. So you're looking to say you want to be able to draw yourself that $100 million dividend check sometime in the future. Dino, you're a real investment banker. You know, I like all this long term, short term, because you have to look at things in that regard. It can't just be, well, they're offering me a salary. Yeah, let me grab that. It's really good money. And that's it. You want to leave your own legacy. You want to be your own man. You want to have your own business as a result of that. You can't just be packing in and running off to these different people who are offering you things. Because at the end of the day, you're not the boss there. It's not yours. That, no, that, that's that's exact true. You know, at the end of the day, um, somebody might call you, make an offer and, you know, $20 million, for example, per annum as salary. And that is really a very attractive and enticing compensation. And you will look at it. But you look at it from the perspective, okay, so I'll go there and I'll generate $5 billion in revenues for them. And at the end of the year, the shareholders, the majority shareholders will draw themselves a $500 million check, you know, and you are still at $20 million. So you say, okay, I'll forego that $20 million for five years with the expectation that by the fifth year, you'll be able to look at yourself and draw yourself a massive dividend check also. So that's kind of the approach and the mindset. You have to back yourself and you really have to believe that you'll be actually able to do it and to achieve it because self-doubt will creep in, right? So you have to keep on reassuring yourself and you have to have that, you know, team around you in terms of your family, friends, supporters, um, that will really be there so looking to support you, to push you up and to encourage you every step of the way. I can see that the dream is really working and what you plan to do that is really bearing fruit now. Because you recently 
acquired more or increased your capacity to serve the public a bit more with the acquisition of an investment banking license. Where do you plan to take the business now that you have that kind of uh, power and strength? Well, I mean, this, this gives us the opportunity to offer so much more. So um, prior to now, we were offering financial products such as loans, foreign exchange trading, remittances, and bill payments, some amount of equity funding. But um, with this now, we're able to actually build real wealth for our clients. So we're able to create portfolios um, for our customers. We're able to raise capital for their expansion or to um, acquire companies. We're able to manage their assets and liabilities um, as a company or proprietor portfolio. We're very strong in terms of trading of stocks and bonds. So this has opened up a wide range of opportunity and we're now a full service um, investment banking outfit. Um, that can offer um, almost anything to our clients. A lot of space there to spread your wings and fly and do lots of freedom things. I like that. <laughs> now, but setting up a new bank like you are doing, how do you think you might take, how long do you think it might take for you to break even and get into the black or are you there already? Well, I mean, with all aspect of, of business, um, I, I've always look to keep our costs down to, to really minimal levels until we start to earn strong returns. So we're not going to be starting out paying ourselves high money, so we're not going to be starting out with high overhead costs, um, high rent or anything like that. We're looking now to build um, something that is really strong. You know, we're working um, through now in terms of our prospectus and our plans in terms of where we're looking to go, how we're going to raise additional capital to build our portfolio of investment assets. So we're doing a lot of that background work now. So we're really not, even though we have been talking one-on-one -on -one with clients, we have really not come out in a very strong and aggressive way as yet. But by the first quarter of 2021, we should be really out there um, in doing a lot of things you know, raising capital, building our marketing portfolio and all of that. So we're looking to, to get things right on the back end first before we come out in a very strong and aggressive way. And as you mentioned that about raising capital and things like those, I was thinking of um, in terms of your capital structure, would you say that a business like yours would prefer to rely on equity financing or is gearing a better way of structuring your business and your finances in terms of how you pay for your operations? So a company, if a small company, um, you require, equity is always better because it gives you that breathing room to grow. And it also, what it does is also, especially if you have good equity partners, what it does is also increase the knowledge pool within the organization. So you'll have a team of persons you know, who would have contributed capital, who can sit on your board and um, be looking to you know discuss ideas and plans and widen that scope for you. Um, I think we are at a stage though that we are more looking for hi hybrid, so we're looking more um, for a mix of debt and equity because we have. I think we have actually um, reached to a stage where we're, we're comfortable and we are secured. We have weathered that early. Um, stage that storming stage in terms of the growth of the company. So now we're at the stage now where we can take debt, you know, our revenues dictate that we'll be able to service a, a certain amount of debt. But we're also very much interested in equity um, partnerships. Interesting one there. But I hear that investment bankers can't sleep at nights because their minds are constantly ferreting and appraising investment options and whether you know it is following trends in grain or oil or you know the stock markets or bauxite, wherever. Is there any truth to that? Well, there's some truth to that, John, because um, as I think the, the financial markets are open 24 hours a day. So from the market opens at five o'clock on a Sunday, it never closes until five o'clock on a Friday. Because when um, us in the Western Hemisphere um, are asleep, Australia opens and then um, Asia opens, then Europe opens and then US opens um, at eight o'clock the next morning. So there's always some amount of activity that's happening and market moving 
news or events can happen at any time. So um, you always have to be asleep with one eye open in terms of or to set yourself alarm to check what's going on. So yeah, there is some truth to that. Um, not more from a worry side, but just to keep abreast. Yeah, with what's going on to see, you know, if you're making the right decision. So I take it that you do a lot of work on the international scenes then? You don't just concentrate locally. A lot of your portfolios extend beyond the shores of Jamaica. Yes, definitely. Um, as investors and investment bankers know, you would never consider just um, keeping your portfolio to any one um, region or any one country. So, you know, we're trading in, in assets all across the world. There are good quality assets in almost any country. It's just for you as a banker to do your research and you know with the tools that are available now you can sit at your desk and do in-depth research on a lot of different assets and be able to make decisions and to make money in any country well dino before i let you go i always like to challenge my guests to see how much they know about reggae and dance or music our musical heritage i generally take questions from this book here it's called reggae larger than life the ultimate reggae music fun and games book it's written by myself and this book is currently available from Amazon. It also, if you're into apps, the Android version is available from the Google Play Store. Just type in Reggae Larger Than Life Fun App, and before you know it, you can download it, and it's all yours. Now, Dean, I've selected two questions for you, so I hope as an investment banking banker, you know, while you're in the office, you've got your radio <laughs> running in the background, and you're listening to two tunes, you know? <laughs> so let's hope you, you did that. So I've selected... Um, Two questions here. The first one now is, this Rastafarian Jamaican brother kindly brought us a whole lot of greetings from Ja in 1986. What was the name of this brother? The options are Luciano, Everton Blender, Coco Tea, and Half Pint. Half Pint, Dina. Well, I see the investment bank has been listening and rocking quietly <laughs> when he's working, you know, which is good, you know, because all play, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. So you've got to have a little bit of fun there, get a bit of company as you evaluate all those investment options and portfolios and everything for your clients. Now, the second and last question now before we wrap this all up is right here and now. So let's go for that now. This one says, he questioned why everything we go on a foreign, Adi Yadi gets the blame. Who is this artist? The options are Shabba Ranks, Buja Banton, Tony Rebel, Super Cat. That's definitely Buja Banton, my all-time favorite DJ. Uh, uh, is it? Right. Well, you know, if I knew that, I wouldn't have picked a Buja Banton one. <laughs> I would have given you a little bit more challenge. But you know what? Anyway, I got that information late. You promised that we would talk again. So definitely, next time we talk, it won't be this easy. I can tell you that. All right, John. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. Dino, it was, it was really good talking to you. And as I said, Reggae Larger Than Life, the questions were taken from this book here, Reggae Larger Than Life, written by myself. It's available on Amazon. Also, if you're into app, the Android version is available from the Google Play Store. Just type in Reggae Larger Than Life fun app, download it, and you have lots and lots of fun. So, Dino, thank you so much for talking with us. And I tell you what, it was really refreshing listening to you and also talking to you again after all these years at KT. Thank you very much, Sean. It was great talking to you also. I hope we'll catch up again soon. And thank well, I really hope so too. Thank you so much, uh, Dino. Thanks too for watching. And remember, please subscribe, leave your comment, and let us know how we're doing. Also like and share. Until next time, this is Sean Kane saying thanks for watching. See you soon.